my first question is, we were treating acute myeloid leukemia with 7 and 3 in 1977. We are still doing the same. What is the best way forward to change this by 2030? I think 7-3 uh, is uh, a sort of poster child for uh, what is wrong with AML sometimes, but then it's also a poster child for what is right with AML. Right? It uh, gave hope to patients who otherwise uh, did not have hope. Uh, uh, there was uh, no remission and no survival, and then we saw remissions and we saw survivals. Uh, the survival has improved. Uh, uh, I think as uh, molecular targets have been identified, uh, uh, newer agents have been uh, developed, uh, things have uh, continued to improve. Uh, uh, I think um, uh, the constraint is not so much understanding or not understanding the disease, but the fact that uh, the treatments uh, tend to be toxic and the major age group that afflicts, uh, that is afflicted by acute myeloid leukemia is older patients who do not tolerate today's uh, treatments. Uh, so perhaps what we need is uh, uh, treatments that are uh, not necessarily curative in the conventional sense of the term, but something that can control the disease and keep uh, some of these older individuals uh, living uh, uh, functionally, normally and well for an extended period of time. Kind of a, uh, like an operational cure, uh, which is a term we had coined in the context of myeloma. So I, I think uh, one has to customize the cure to the patient. Okay. Uh, my next question is that there are almost 4 million papers on cancer. 150,000 in 2018 alone. But there's a staggering disconnect between great scientific insights and translation into improved therapy. What are we doing wrong? Uh, I think it's very easy to cure cancer and kill malignant cell lines uh, in test tubes. Uh, unfortunately, human beings are not test tubes. Uh, the environment is much more complex. Uh, the uh, the way clinical trials uh, uh, tend to run it is uh, it is difficult to uh, try more than one investigational agent at a time uh, you know perhaps we need to uh, do things in a slightly different way uh, perhaps we need to try more than one investigational agent uh, at a time and uh, perhaps a regulatory framework has to develop where that can be done right now we can only try one investigational drug at a time as far as the, the incredible volume of material is concerned, uh, there is a great deal of pressure on everybody to, to produce. Uh, and I actually think that the onus is on the reader, the researcher, the clinician, to try and separate the wheat from the chaff. Uh, one has to look at the thing and not get carried away, but be able to critically analyze uh, what may be worthwhile and what might not be uh, worthwhile. Uh, uh, you know, I think there are journals that uh, ought not to exist, that uh, exist for business reasons. And uh, I think it's up to the reader to realize that, look, this is something that one should not pay uh, attention to. I think people sometimes also forget biology when they uh, uh, do these things, uh, when, they, when they try to uh, put something into practice. Uh, one has to critically question the data that are presented. Uh, uh, there was a paper in uh, myeloma uh, many years ago uh, that uh, didn't seem logical showing uh, that uh, uh, tandem transplantation was inferior to single transplantation. It's a controversial topic, uh, as you know. Uh, number of studies showing superiority, number of studies showing equivalence. But this was the only one that showed uh, um, uh, the exact opposite of one would, what one would expect and pay, people started accepting that as the truth without questioning it and a few years later it was proven to be fraudulent. So I think it's very important that uh, uh, people question things uh, 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 appropriately. And uh, I think uh, keeping a good time frame in mind is worthwhile. Uh, what comes to mind is how uh, high dose chemotherapy in breast, in breast cancer, metastatic breast cancer was uh, given up as being uh, not so useful 
and just recently there was a 20 year update on the project that showed that there are subgroups of patients that may benefit. So I think just keeping an open mind right from the beginning and keeping it that way is another way to perhaps try and uh, get one's teeth into ideas that are useful. Hmm. Okay, the third question is the fact children respond to the same treatment better than adults seems to suggest that the biology of cancer is different but also it could mean that the host is different. Since most cancers increase with age, even having good therapy may not matter as the host is decrepit. Solution? <laughs> uh, of course, uh, there are uh, uh, cancers uh, that the children have that are much more simple but leaving those aside and just looking at uh, some of the more complex malignancies that could be biologically perhaps similar, uh, the age is always going to affect the outcome. And I think uh, um, uh, the solution is for people to try and maintain good health throughout lives, you know, like preparing for, for everything. Uh, uh, when a patient is diagnosed with a malignancy, I tell them to take care of their general health as well. And perhaps what we need to do is to uh, uh, take care of health throughout life so that whatever block may be encountered, be it uh, heart disease or, or cancer, one can deal with it and uh, withstand uh, whatever challenges there are better than otherwise. Um, uh, but aside from that, you know, looking at patients who actually have the disease, um, development of uh, more targeted uh, treatments uh, uh, you know once again trying to see if under certain circumstances uh, achieving an equilibrium uh, between uh, wellness and presence of uh, a small amount of disease as opposed to trying to eradicate all the disease at any cost uh, could be done for older individuals that may be a way to try and uh, uh, extract benefit without uh, exacting at all. Hmm. Fourth question is you have great knowledge and experience in the field. If you were given limitless resources to plan a cure for cancer, what would you do? Tough one because uh, lots of people have uh, mounted uh, battles and wars on cancer and tried to shoot for the moon and all those things. Uh, um, so firstly, I sometimes wonder if cancer is actually curable, all cancers. There are certain cancers which are, uh, which are definitely uh, curable and I think we have achieved that with the currently available treatments, chemotherapy, immunotherapy, uh, cell therapy, stem cell transplantation and, and so on. But as far as the others are concerned, um, I think uh, 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 having smart, dedicated people working on different aspects of the, the continuum, trying to find what is wrong biologically and then uh, involve chemists perhaps uh, uh, or uh, uh, pay, uh, individuals in other disciplines not necessarily working on, uh, on the malignancy itself to find out how to disrupt uh, certain pathways and then clinicians to, to plan uh, clinical trials and maybe have a group of uh, uh, very smart people who do crazy random things, try and put together data and uh, observations in ways that have uh, not, that has not been done before. That may be a way to go and if these are people, especially the last group of people are, uh, are are funded and they don't have to think about uh, how to uh, get their next grant and next paycheck and just just think completely outside the the box uh, kind of like planning a, a self-driving car uh, look at the problem in a totally different way i think that uh, model having a lot of organization but then also an element of randomness and disorganization may be an interesting way to approach this. Very interesting. Last question. Offering patients with advanced stage non-curable cancer, palliative 
but toxic treatments is a service or a disservice in the current therapeutic paradigm? I think that is um, uh, very individual to the malignancy, the very individual to the to the patient uh, and 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 the physician. Uh, um, the uh, the individual example that comes to my mind is uh, linalidomide. Uh, uh, which uh, uh, I gave for the first time to a patient of mine in uh, 2000. Uh, uh, I think for a year and a half he was perhaps the only person in the world getting the drug, end stage myeloma and uh, uh, did uh, very well uh, uh, from end stage disease, uh, could then go to a trial of bortezomib. Uh, but he was somebody who could perhaps withstand therapy instead of going to hospice. Uh, if I did not have that drug available and I had to give uh, uh, chemotherapy that would made him uh, that would have made him very sick, perhaps I would not have uh, done that. Uh, but I think the key is to keep one's mind open because sometimes uh, uh, very interesting observations, very interesting drugs, very interesting uh, uh, therapeutic uh, paradigms emerge uh, by keeping uh, one's mind. Uh, open and uh, one could argue that a patient who is uh, uh, on the verge of death is in many ways the the most um, willing uh, uh, experimental subject of uh, all and perhaps a subject where one may have uh, uh, less uh, regret about uh, trying something. Another thing I always think of when uh, thinking of hospice care is not just thinking of the patient, but also thinking of the loved ones that the patient uh, leaves behind. Uh, one would like to stop treatment at a perfect time for a given patient, and one often cannot do that. Uh, and I always think of the fact that uh, if the patient's family is left behind thinking that uh, the end did not necessarily come at the right time, they are more likely to be uh, comfortable or as less uncomfortable as possible with the concept of having tried everything, mm -hmm. uh, then with the concept that perhaps they pulled out a little too early and let their loved ones uh, go. I think that would be a very heavy burden to live with. Uh. Very nice. Thank you so much.